for our struggle is not against your next door neighbor's dog. It's not against your spouse. It's not against your boss. It's not against political figures. It's, it's not against flesh and blood, but against, look at this, rulers, against authorities. Check this out. Against the powers of this dark world. It sounds like a Star Wars movie, huh? And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And those are some pretty strong words that there are authorities, that there are rulers, that there are powers of the dark world, that there's a war going on, and there's a dark world, spiritual forces of evil. And then you get this little phrase that's mentioned four times alone in the book of Ephesians, in the heavenly realm, in the heavenly realms, as if to say there's another realm than the realm you and I are living in right now. And yes, there is. There is another realm in operation right now that is happening right now. And you guys have sensed it. You know this because you asked for it. You already sensed this going on. You know it. Because, you know, some, some things can't even be explained. There are some tragedies or trials or circumstances that, you, that they happen and you think like, this cannot be coincidence. It happens at times, at strategic times. Are you ready for this? It happens at opportune times where you say, man, this, there's... What is really going on here? And you sense something deeper because there's another realm going on, a heavenly realm that's operating. You can't see it, but it's very much in operation right now. So therefore, the Bible continues, therefore, put on the full armor of God. You're in a battle and you need to dress for it. And we're going to give you the armor at the end of this message. So that, not if, but when. So that when the day of evil comes. There is a day of evil coming. Come on, pastor, be a little more encouraging. Can you be positive a little bit? Okay, I'm positive. There's a day of evil coming for you, okay? <laughs> you just need to, be, you need to know that. You asked for it. I'm trying to help you prepare for this, that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand, which is the end goal, is, is my hope, my prayer, my goal today is that you would be upright in the middle of the fight that you wouldn't keep getting knocked down, that you would keep, would, would keep getting blindsided by the enemy, we, that you would stop fighting your battle in the wrong realm, in the wrong areas, in things that you can see, in the flesh and blood. So some of you think that if you need to yell louder, you need to manipulate more, you need to lie, you need to, you need to kind of take control of the situation. And God has given you different weapons to fight with than the weapons you are using. He's giving you different weapons. And my goal today is to have you stand up under that fight. Um, and I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be a good pastor if I didn't shine some light on this topic every now and then. I really wouldn't. And, and the Bible actually encourages me, encourages me as a pastor to, like, to expose some of these things. Ephesians chapter 5 actually says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. And like, like some of us are treating this far too lightly. And you need to wrestle with yourself what those fruitless deeds of darkness may be in your own life. But he says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So that's what I'm going to do here today. I'm going to expose the devil for who he is. Come on, someone say amen. amen. All right, take some good notes, okay? Here, here's number one. Here's the first thing you need to know, and that is that the devil is real. The devil is real. The devil is, is not a symbol of evil, as some Christians believe. The devil is not a cosmic force. He's not a metaphor. He's not some nasty guy in a red jumpsuit with a pitchfork. That's not, that's not, he's not that at all. The Bible actually says he's a person, or better yet, he's an angel. He's a fallen angel. The Bible actually records three names, three, three angels by name in the Bible. The, the, the Bible talks about the angel Michael, the angel Gabriel, and the angel Lucifer. And all of them, at one point in time, they were in heaven. And before we actually, the, all the Bible stories ever happened, Satan fell and was cast out of heaven. And I believe, as some scholars believe, that this event of Satan getting cast out of heaven actually happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. In Genesis, in between there, there's a little punctuation mark in the, in the original text, which denotes a time, a space. So after Genesis 1-1, a lot of you guys know that verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then there's a gap. There's a space of time. And then verse 2, and the earth became formless and void. 
So many scholars believe that that is the time that, the, the, that Satan, that Lucifer, was cast down to earth, and there was this destruction that happened on earth that caused formlessness and void. Because God wouldn't create something that is formless and void. God is perfect in all of his ways. He creates good things, perfect things come down from the Father of heavenly light. So, so what happened here, a lot of scholars believe right there it was where the enemy got cast down and brought destruction upon the earth. And for those of you extra note takers, let me give you some extra scriptures here because it's recorded in two different Old Testament scriptures. You might want to write these down. Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28 record this event actually happened. Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28, where Satan was cast down, Lucifer was cast down from heaven. The Bible records a time where Satan kind of said, um, and, you know, all the worship I'm leading for you, God, I actually want that myself. I, I want to get. I want to get the worship. I want to be the one who is worshipped and adored and revered like you are. And, and God didn't like that too much. He said, "I don't think so, buddy." And 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 he and and he cast them down. So there was this. And Jesus was actually there. The Bible records this in Luke chapter ten. Another scripture for you. Luke chapter ten. Jesus says. He says, "I was there." Because the eternal son was there at this time. He was at the right hand of the father. He says, I was there and I saw, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning, he fell. So it wasn't, it wasn't like, like you think the Star Wars movies, you know, the dark, the four, the, what is it? The dark force versus the, the good force, whatever, man. It's not, it wasn't like this, oh, the evil forces were winning, they're edging them out and here comes God at the last minute and he wins and he pins them down. That's not what happened. It's, Jesus said, as soon as my dad, decided to deal with it, it was boom, over, end credits roll. That was the shortest movie ever, okay? It, that, that, was, that was it. When he decided to do it, he did it definitively, boom, over. Revelations records it yet again. Here's another place, Revelation chapter 12. It says, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and the, those angels, the demons, fought back. And, and now this one took a little bit longer because this was just in like an angelic and demonic war. Now watch this though. And I had to highlight this because I started shouting in my study. It says, but he was not strong enough. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you, he lies to you to make you believe he is stronger. But if you're a child of God today, if you're a believer in Jesus, he is not strong enough. He's not strong enough. I will amen myself. Come on, somebody. And they, and the they there is the third of the angels that followed Satan now and became demons. They lost their place in heaven. Check this out. And the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. I want you to notice this detail right here. He was hurled to the earth. So out of heaven, in that domain, in that realm, to this realm. This is, this is where Satan was, was thrown into this, this realm that you and I now inhabit. And his angels or his demons with him, and that's what you need to know, that the Bible says he's operating right now in this realm. And perhaps that's why the earth became formless and void. And perhaps that's why he's trying to make your life formless and void. Perhaps he's trying to bring a Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 experience in your life where you become formless, where you just don't have structure, where you are not have purpose or identity. He wants to bring chaos and destruction where you are void of just purpose in your life. The enemy desires to do that. He's against you. He is against you. You have a real enemy and he's against you. I want you to jot these down. They're not in your notes, but extra stuff here about what the Bible says about the ruler of uh, or about the Lucifer or Satan, John chapter 12, verse 31, calls him the ruler of this world. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that he is the little g God, the God of this age. Ephesians 2, 2 says he's the prince of the power of the air. 1 John 5, 19 says that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. That's a lot of verses just to talk about this dynamic going on, that the devil is real. Here's the second thing you need to know. Write it down. That the devil is at war with us. The devil is at war with us. So he's strategically scheming, devising a way to destroy you. He's working right now. And even it doesn't matter. If you say, well, I don't believe that, Pastor Jason, it doesn't make it any less true. Okay? It's, it's what is happening 
right now. It doesn't go away. Just because you don't fight doesn't mean that, that the fight goes away. You'll become a casualty of war if you don't realize that there is a war going on. You'll fight the wrong battles. You'll wage war on the wrong battlefield. You'll, go, you'll continue fighting the wrong enemy. And one of the best guess, gifts I can give you today is just an awareness of what is really happening, of the war that is really happening. That's why First Peter says in chapter 5, he says, be self-controlled and alert. He says, wake up, church. Wake up. Be alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Now, a lion does not go up to his prey and say, hey, I'm kind of hungry. I'm thinking you're looking good. I'm going to take you out. He doesn't say that. The lion, what does he do? He, he hides. He, he, he covers. He lies in cover, and he he, he waits undercover and pounces at the right time, at the opportune time on his prey, looking for someone to devour. So don't just sit back there. And my goodness, church, don't, don't, for goodness sake, don't get scared. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Stand firm in your faith. I'm going to teach you how in just a few minutes. But you need to realize that your enemy is lying in cover. He's waiting. And in the temptations of Jesus, when the only recorded time in the Bible that that Satan actually confronted and Jesus confronted Satan is here's some more for you note takers and more scriptures, Matthew chapter four and Luke chapter four. The two gospels record this encounter that Jesus had with, with Satan. Um, and in this encounter where the enemy came after and tried to mess with Jesus, the Bible says that the devil left and watch this in Luke chapter 10 or four, verse 13, it says that the, that the devil left until an opportune time until an opportune time. So, oh, okay, you got me this time, but I'll be back. Uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be waiting. I'll be watching for the, for the right moment again for me to try to come when you're at your weakest, when, you're, when, when I can try to trip you up, mess with you. I'm going to scheme away until I can. I'm waiting for another opportunity. You need to know that's how he operates. Here's the third thing. The devil has power. The devil has has power. He has power. Now, I get asked this question a lot. Like, can, people ask me, like, can Christians get possessed of the devil, like by a demonic spirit? And, and, and I mean, I personally don't believe a Christian can because when the Spirit of God lives in you, and that's what actually happens when you, could, when you accept Jesus, the Bible says that the Spirit of God, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit now. And how can a, a, something that is inhabiting the Spirit of God inhabit a, 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 a demonic spirit as well? I just don't think it can, it can happen, all right? I, I, don't, I don't think so. But every Christian, listen, every Christian can be harassed, can be oppressed, can be attacked by that enemy. You can suffer greatly at the hands of the enemy. And check this out, please listen. You have more to do with that than you realize. You have more to do with what the enemy is taking from you and how much he is harassing you than you actually realize. I want to show you this important scripture here in Ephesians chapter 4. Um, it's talking about anger so it's really not talking about spiritual warfare, but there's an important detail that you need to notice. It says, in your anger, do not sin. So we all get angry from time to time, but don't let it go too far, he says. Don't, don't, in your anger, don't sin. Don't let it get out of control. And especially, he says, don't let it go unresolved. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. See, all of us sin, but, but you don't need to stay in your sin. Because if you do, he says, you give the devil a foothold. You, you leave a crack in the door, in the window. You leave the door open for the enemy whenever you leave things unresolved and you stay in some sin and you let it go to another place. And so the Bible says, I mean, don't get paranoid and think every time you sin, every time you get angry, now you open the door to the enemy and he's going to have havoc. No, no, no. That's not, what he's, that's not what it's saying at all. It's whenever you let it go too far and you leave it unresolved. So you have a lot to do with how successful the enemy is at harassing your life and the havoc he's creating and what he's taking from your life. You have a, you have a, a lot to do with that. Now, that's a lot of bad news. Let me give you some good news, everybody. Jot this down. And that is that the devil is subject to our God. Can I get a good amen, you guys? He trembles at our God. He already had one encounter with our God and and. And that lasted a millisecond, okay? He, he, doesn't, he, he trembles 
at our God. And every anytime you align yourself with the God you serve, you become as victorious as God is over the devil. And that's why the Bible says in 1 John 4, 4, he says, you dear, dear children, wonderful people of Discovery Church, you are from God and you have, say that word out loud, you have, you have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Now, you're not so great, and I'm not so great, but he is great, and he is in me, and the one who is in me is greater than the one who is in the world. You ought to praise God right now. There's a spiritual dynamic going on right now, and let me, let me kind of tell you what I'm not saying, because I need to clarify this. I, what I'm not saying is go around and say there's a devil under every rock, Okay. I'm not, I'm not saying that. you got to name every attitude and spirit. Spirit of this, spirit of that, spirit of this. Stop it, okay? Just stop it. There's not a demon. You run out of gas. Well, there must be a Chevron demon around here somewhere. No, no, I just forgot to fill it up. Stop it, okay? That's not what I'm saying at all. So don't, don't hear that. Don't go there. But I personally believe that there's a lot more going on than we realize. I do. I think there's a lot more spiritually going on than we realize. There's another realm that we don't realize, I, I believe that, that what we're experiencing even in, in our nation right now, in America, that it's more spiritual than it is natural. The, the things, that are going, things that are going on in our city, in Bakersfield, it's more spiritual than it is natural. I'm not saying we don't respond in the natural. We, we need to respond in the natural. I'm not, say, I'm not saying there's an abdication of that, but I'm saying there is more going on spiritual, like, like the addiction, the violence, the, the attack on our families and fatherhood that we see, even specifically here in our city, in Bakersfield. Of what go, There is so much more. So you know what? We need to, we need to not just attack it naturally. We need, to, we need to fight with this war spiritually, because the Bible says you're in a fight. You need to learn how to fight a spiritual War. So let me show you a verse, and then I'm going to show you how. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 4. It says, For though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. So we don't use bombs and guns and tactics in modern-day warfare. We don't use none of that. The weapons we fight with, he says, are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, strongholds in the Greek is ohroma. And it literally means any lie of the enemy that keeps you trapped. That's what it means. In any lie that is against God's word, but just by believing it, it makes it become a reality in your life. And that word demolish, demolish is kathario in the Greek, kathario. And what that means is to violently cast down. So this, this is not passive at all. It's not a passive thing. And you may like your kumbaya Christianity, you know, but, but the Bible says, buckle up. There's, there's more to do. Yes, part of your Christianity is, is this communion with God, and it's beautiful, and it's, and it's great, but there's another part of your Christianity that is confrontation of the devil. It's confrontation of principalities, of powers, and of the dark world. It's both of these things, and you cannot treat it passively anymore. You can't. You need to be aware of the war that is happening around you. And, and don't be afraid of it. Don't, don't be freaked out by it. Stand your ground. Fight your fight. But don't treat it passively. We have to use these weapons, which begs the questions, you know, what are, what are those weapons and how do I use them? All right? If, if, if the weapons that God has given us, that he has given us weapons, it's nothing of this world, then what are those weapons and how do I use them? That's a great question. Let me give you three weapons from the scriptures that we have, you have, and I'll show you even how to use them. The three things that God says are your weapons to fight your spiritual war. Okay, here's number one. Write it down. Number one, the name of Jesus. That's your first weapon. Come on, the name of Jesus. We intentionally sing songs about Jesus. We lift the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name. What a powerful name he, it is. Why? Listen, listen. Because names have power. Names have power. Cancer is a powerful name. Anxiety is a powerful name. Debt is a powerful name. Addiction is a powerful name. Depression, any of you ever experienced that or know people that have gone through that, is a powerful name. But I got good news for you, church, that Philippians chapter 2 says, our God exalted Jesus to, say it out loud, he exalted Jesus to the 
highest place. Come on. And gave him the name that is above every name. Someone needs to worship the name of Jesus right there. Let me give you an example of this. We're, we're, we're in, we'll be in the Hannah's home, okay, in, 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 in my home, the Hannah's home. And, and I'll tell one of my kids to, um, you know, go get, go get your brother and sister. Tell them it's time for dinner. They go, okay. They go, it's time for dinner. They go, Nothing. Did, what happened? I don't know. Well, did you tell them it's time for dinner? Yeah, I did. Okay. okay. Tell them dad said it's time for dinner. Okay. Dad said, <laughs> why? Because in the Hannah's home, there is a name that is above all other names. Come on, parents. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Because, because if, it was, if, it's just, if it's just my a sibling going over there and telling, I ain't got to listen to you. Who are you? You want to listen to you? But once you invoke the name that is above every name in the Hannah's house, no, I'm just kidding. There's another name. But you know what I'm talking about. See, child of God, believer, you got a name that you can use that invokes a different reaction around you when you begin to use the name of Jesus with power, with power. It says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And check this out. On heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. See, that name works there, works here, works under there. It works. The name of Jesus. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what do I do, Pastor Jason? How do I, how do, I do that? Well, this is, it's really simple. But let me, let me explain it to you if you, don't, if you, don't, if you can't. Don't really know how to, how to do this. Romans actually tells us, Romans 10, just call on the name. That's it. Just call on the name. You sing the name. You worship the name. You declare the name. You just, you, you just shout the name of Jesus just in every situation. Just say, I know your powerful disease. Yeah, I know your powerful disease. And I know your powerful debt. And I, and I understand anxiety. You're pretty powerful, but I call on the name that is above every name, and I bring into subjection everything because it's the name above all names. Amen? And the devils, I'm telling you, the devils have to line up when you, when you use this weapon, the name of Jesus. They tremble and they fear, and they line up to the name of Jesus. Can I get an Amen. amen. When I pray over you guys' connection cards and stuff, that's what I do is I pray the name and I pray, over, I pray over the church every day. I pray over you guys. And what I do is I just declare the name. So I read different things that are going on in your lives and, and struggles or challenges or relationship things. And I just start to declare over that anxiety, Jesus, in the name of Jesus. God, in that marriage, Jesus. In that financial situation, in that career change, Jesus, I thank you right now. And I lift up your name over your church. And I'm telling you, that's a banner of protection over you, you guys. There's a name. God has given you a name as a weapon. The name of Jesus. There's another weapon. There's more. Here's the second weapon that God has given you. The weapon is the word of God. The word of God. The Word of God has authority. The Word of God has power. I love this verse, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, the Word of God is alive. Man, I love that. It is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. Now, all throughout the Scripture, you're going to see this metaphor of the Word of God being a sword. And a sword is an offensive weapon. Now, check this out. In the, in the armor of God, it's actually the only offensive weapon listed in the entire armor of God. See, some of you guys are fighting and you're using, you're using weapons that you're not authorized to use. You're using anger, you're using yelling, you're using manipulation, you're using worldly tactics for a spiritual enemy. The only weapon that God is giving you to use is to speak the word of God into the, to the heavenly realms. That's what he's giving you. The name of Jesus, the word of God. Let's go back to that Ephesians 6 and finish that where we started. Verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In other words, you're willing to go where God wants you to go. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. That's a defensive weapon with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, and then the only offensive weapon, the sword 
of the Spirit, which is, in case you didn't know it, he says, which is the Word of God. And by the way, that's what Jesus did in the scriptures I already gave you in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Every time the enemy tried to mess with Jesus, tempt Jesus, it was an opportune time. But what was the weapon that Jesus used? Every time Jesus responded to the enemy with scripture, it is written. He used the power of the word of God. Study it, read it, know it. Quote it. I'm telling you, the Bible is not just your feel-good inspirational book. It is the weapon you have. It's the tool. Treat it like one. Quote it. I changed the verses around to mean a first person, like Luke chapter 10, verse 19, says that, that I have been given authority to trample on the heads of serpents, and there, wa- there will by no means anything harm me. I just start to declare the word of God and make it personal and declare it personally over my life, a personal declaration. You have a weapon you need to use against your real enemy. Read it, study it, quote it. I I read the one-year Bible. A lot of you read that one along with me. When I read the one-year Bible, try to read it every day. All I'm trying to do is grab hold of one truth, one truth that'll, that'll, that'll kind of, that I can declare this day. Today was, I was in Psalm 68, and it said that God is awesome in the sanctuary. And I just started declaring, I said, God, you are awesome in this sanctuary. You're going to show up. You're going to be awesome in their life. And then it says, God will empower his people with strength. And I said, God, you're going to give strength today. You're awesome. And I just grab hold of one truth. I'm telling you, the word of God is a weapon that you need to learn how to use, study, and use it as, as, as a weapon of warfare against your enemy. Are you getting anything out of this today, you guys? You asked for it, all right? You got the word, the name of Jesus, the word of God, and here's the third weapon that the Bible says that we have, and that is the power of the cross. The cross of Jesus, there is power in the cross, and this is, this is even where a lot of Christians don't realize the extent of the power of the cross, because a lot of Christians believe, yeah, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He paid my sins so I can go to heaven, and I don't have to go to hell. Now, that's a big part of what happened on the cross. That is a huge part, a large part of what happened there. But Ephesians says that between Friday when he died and on the cross and Sunday when he raised from the dead, Ephesians chapter 4 actually says that Jesus descended to the lower parts of the earth. Did you know that? Well, what in the world was he doing in that time? What was he doing down there? He was confronting your real enemy face to face. And he told him, I have paid the debt. It is paid in full. Hand over the keys. They're mine. Give me the keys of death. There is, see, see there's, the enemy has been disarmed. He, he, anything he can throw at you, no matter what it is, it, it is won and victorious because of the cross of Jesus Christ. So he controls your fate. The, that's, what, that's what the keys mean. Jesus says, no, no, give me those. I control. The, I control their fate over death. And over uh, oh, death does not hold the key to them anymore. I hold the keys. I will control their fate. There's nothing the enemy can throw at you anymore. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 18 says, I am he, Jesus telling John now, the beloved, I am he who lives and was dead. I love that. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And then Jesus amens himself. Amen. You see, I, that's why I can amen myself because Jesus is here. He's preaching at John like, this is who I am. Amen. You know, <laughs> that's why I can do it. I'm just following Jesus. I have the keys of Hades, which is hell, and of the grave of death. You see, I hold, he says, I hold the ultimate future. The cross conquers death. And anything the devil can throw at you, Jesus has already won. So you see, sometimes I even surrender. I surrender the outcome when it doesn't line up with what I thought. Sometimes I just surrender the outcome to God because I know ultimately we won. Ultimately, God, you have the keys of death and you have won. We are victorious. So here on this earth, where he is the prince of the power of the air, where the whole world is lying under his sway. Sometimes the outcome does not line up with what I think. I just go, God, I just love you anyway, and the ultimate outcome is good, so I'm trusting in you. And you just take power away from the enemy because he wants you to believe that he is in control, that he is stronger, and the truth is, we won. We're victorious. He doesn't hold the power or the keys anymore. Jesus is, is in control. Can I get a better amen, you guys? Woo! Revelation chapter 12. Because some of you say, you know what? How do I use that? Because um, 
I understand all, all that stuff, but how do, I, how do I use that? Revelation 12, 11. And they have defeated him, and the they is the church, it's you. They have defeated him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by their, say it out loud, by their testimony. That's it. That's my testimony. What the cross has purchased for me. Hey, I was on a road on sin, addicted. I was, I was, can you just share, this is, this is our testimony. I was caught up in my sin, on a road to hell to pay for my own sins when I didn't need to pay for them. They were already paid for myself, but I was under a shroud of darkness, believing the lies of the enemy, but the cross of Jesus has paid my debt, my sin, and now I am blessed. I am, I am favored by God. I am clothed, the Bible says, with the righteousness of God. Not that I have righteousness within me, and I kind of have earned any of this. No, he has given me righteousness, that I can walk in his blessing, his favor, and his grace. That's my testimony, enemy. You have nothing that you can do to me. That's the word of your testimony. You have the name of Jesus, you have the word of God, and you have the power of the cross. Well, Jason, that makes for a good church service. That makes for a lot of amens and some shouting, but you follow me around, some of you are thinking, in my life, because it doesn't work out that, it doesn't quite work out that way. I just got a call just this last week from someone who said, Pastor, I'm, I'm trying. I'm quoting scriptures. I'm saying the name. I'm like, I'm, I'm claiming stuff. I'm talking about the name of Jesus, but it's not working out that way for me. So I want to just leave you with this final thought about this victory, this victory that you have over the devil. It's not in your notes up here on the screen. Romans chapter eight, verse 35. It says, does it mean he no longer loves us? If we have trouble or calamity, like, praise God for you, you know, but that's not my life. My life is, man, persecuted, hungry, destitute, in danger, threatened with death. But the next verse says what some of you have forgotten here today. Yes, the fight may be hard. Yes, it, it may be a tough fight, but no matter what, you face Discovery Church. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Come on, will you say that with me? I am more than a conqueror. Will you say that out loud with me? Ready? I am more than a conqueror. One more time. I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me and gave his life for me. Write that down. Leave it in your lot. Let's bow our heads in prayer right there. Bow your heads with me.